I basically sent out a warning that's associated to this book, which is titled The Judges. And the reason being is because it's fairly explicit on the content that's in it. And we won't get into the the really bad stuff towards um, probably the third or fourth session. But let's talk about the time period, because I know that's one thing that Shelley always asks, is like, where are we talking about when this happened? So in our book, we have... Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kinahan, Mahalalel, these are all what we would consider the patriarchs that led up to Abraham. So when we open our Bible, it starts in Genesis. We know Adam was the first man. He gave, he had, he gave, well, Eve gave birth to Seth. And the list goes down. Some of the names that really should jump out to you is Enoch and Noah. Remember, and then Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But this gets us down to Abraham. And this is really the lineage of Abraham. And we know that Abraham gave birth to Isaac. Michelle, who did Isaac give birth to? It went Abraham, Isaac, and then who? He had 12 kids. No. Actually, Ishmael was one of his sons. It was one of Abraham's sons, not Isaac's So, It was Jacob. That's where we get the 12 tribes of Jacob. And Miguel, what was Jacob's name changed to? Israel. That is correct. So we're talking about the 12 tribes or the 12 sons of Jacob, also known as the 12 tribes of Israel. And Michelle, name one of the 12 kids of Jacob. If I call on you, I cheat. No. If I call on you, I cheat. Levi, good job, babe. <laughs> Levi, give me one. No, give me another one. If he was if he was a Jamaican, he'd be a Jamin. He'd be what? Benjamin? <laughs> Okay, maybe not. I guess my jokes aren't my jokes aren't landing over here. We got Benjamin, Joseph, right? And we're not going to go through all of them because that's not what it's about today. But from Joseph, the whole tribes, everybody moved into Egypt, and every remember everybody remembers Egypt because we had this event that took place. Is Mike? Mike, can you hear me? Can Big Mike hear me? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Shelly, can you hear me? She must be, we must be muted. Okay. Michelle was right. Yes. She had we the can hear you. Oh, okay. You're um, on you're on mute. Landed handed it back to me on mute. Okay. So the when they were in Egypt, we had something that was known as the Exodus, which is which is all of Israel leaving Egypt. But there were some things that happened in Egypt that led up to that where Moses was saying, let my people go. We know about, we call them the 10 plagues. Michelle, can you name one? Yes. Mike or Shelly or anyone over there, can you name one more? Uh, the <laughs> blood, the river. <clears throat> yes. The locust. Yep. Two, three, four. The boils. Yes. Yeah. Firstborn sun, yes. Darkness was another one. We had hail. Okay, a bunch of them. Ooh, I heard fire. Okay. Fly, fire flies. Yeah, and not at the same time. It would have been nice if they were fireflies. Um, <laughs> but that got us to Moses. So Moses was to lead the people to the promised land, but they grumbled and they complained, and so they wandered in the desert for how long, Miguel? 40 years. 40 years. After <laughs> Moses died... They entered into the promised land under who? Landon should, Landon should know this one. Yes, it was under Joshua. And that brings us up to the point where we're at right now. So if you're wondering why we're talking about judges, this is the time period 
that occurs between the tail end of Moses and Joshua and the introduction into the kings, which would be Saul, David, Solomon, and, you know, the list kind of goes from there. If we were to look at the last chapter of the book that leads into the book of Judges, you would see that it is this long excerpt from Joshua basically talking about how, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But he gives them, and I believe this is called a benediction, but Joshua says, and I'm not going to read this whole thing because this does get prefaced in Judges chapter 2, but it says here, Joshua says to the people, you cannot serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive transgression nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do harm and consume you after he has done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now, therefore, he said, <clears throat> put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And all the people said to Joshua, the Lord, our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in a book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it thereupon in the, under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, behold, this stone shall be a witness for us, for it is heard all the words of the Lord, which he spoken to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you and lest you deny God. Um, and as we scroll down, it says Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. So. The people leading up into the book of jo into the book of Judges had really turned towards God. They had made this huge change. The leadership reflected that as well. It trickled down from Joshua, all the people who were elected elders at that time. They adhered to the rules, regulations, and really a heart after God. They didn't go after idols. They did. They did the right thing. And so that leads us into the death of Joshua and the death of those men. And we see that God raises up judges. Now, that's why this title is called Judges. When you think of a judge, Michelle, what's the first thing that comes to mind? A judge from a courthouse. So some people might say like a fake wig with long hair and a gavel and, and those types of things. But the judges out of the book of Judges were more or less like these heroic tribal leaders or people who were really set aside by God through the Holy Spirit to do some really amazing work I... or action to free the people out of bondage. I'm going to I'll have a pop quiz for you guys going into it. Does can Levi, can you name me one judge out of the book of Judges? Love you. Good night. Max, no. Okay, so I'll give you a hint. One of them is Samson. Another one of the judges is Gideon. Remember Gideon? We have a woman judge. Her name is Deborah. She was a prophetess. And we will actually get into a few more, but these are names that I'm certain everyone's heard. I mean, how many people don't have a giant dog that's named Samson? You know? Daniel, Ehud, Shambhagar. All right, we'll stop looking into it. We're going to go over it today. So <clears throat> what was special about these people is that the Holy Spirit was put on them. They were set aside for a specific purpose. Now, you'll note before we get into the book that I have a, a, you know, a warning label here that says that there's graphic content. I prefaced that before. There will be some content in here that is not appropriate to read in, in front of small children. Um, <clears throat> and it's not just about, you know, murder and slaughter and things of that sort. So on that note, 
We'll get right into the first chapter. I'm going to go ahead and let my kids know that it's time to settle down. Please, guys, this is important to me. Dad likes doing this. It, yeah, it's wrapped around your neck. <laughs> okay, so we're done. We're done with that stuff. Everyone settle down. This is your one and only warning for right now. Thank you. Thank you. And don't wrap things around your neck. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Starting in chapter one. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So we're off to a good start, right? Joshua's dead. Their leader that they look to these things. They, he's not there anymore. So they're going straight to... That's Uncle Charlie. Hey, Uncle Charlie. I'm going to keep you on speakerphone. We just started. We are on the first verse of chapter one. I'll just keep you on speaker if that's okay. That's okay. I'll, I'll, get, my, I'll get my Bible. So I can <laughs> okay. So, you. no Isn't problem. It? Now, after Isn't the death... It? Yes. It's not Joshua. It's not dead. It was Moses. No, Joshua's dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. All good. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked, saying, asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me to be allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I will likewise, likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. Okay, if we remember, Miguel, what does Adonai mean? The, the people from... Uh... That region, right? The Adonites? <clears throat> no, so Adonai would be the Lord, right? Or oh, Adonai, those yeah. lines. And then Bezek is the, the 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 nation. So, and they found Adonai Bezek, which I would believe to be either the Lord or the king of Bezek in Bezek. Okay. And they fought against him and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then Adonai That's Bezek fled and they pursued him and caught and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, used to gather scraps under my table as I have done, so God has repaid me. So what do you think it means to cut off someone's thumbs and big toes? Okay, so... Could you see someone running into battle without a big toe? So they, they you took a, you took their way their ability to run out of battle. Could you see someone trying to shoot an, a bow and arrow? So by doing this, it's it takes their place away from them from being a king or a leader. They can't charge into a battle. So I thought that that was really cool. That's something I learned going into this. Now this particular individual says that he's done this seventy times over. And he basically deserved what's coming his way. That's what he says, is that 70 kings have done this and now God has repaid me. So now what do they do with him? They brought him to Jerusalem and there he died. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the city of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountains in the south and in the lowland. Then Judah went up against the Canaanites who dwelt in Hebron, now the name of Hebron was formerly Kirjath Arba, and they killed Shishai, Ash, Ahiman, and Talmai. From there they went against the inhabitants of Deber. The name of Deber was formerly Kirjath Sefer. Then Caleb said, Whoever attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it to him, I will give my daughter Achish as wife, or Aksh, Akshsa as wife, and Othniel, the son of Kenez, Caleb's younger brother took it. So he gave him his daughter at Achish as wife. So Joshua had was given instructions by God, which they came originally from Moses, which was to go and inhabit 
the land that was promised to them. But in Deuteronomy, it talks all about how they were supposed to drive these people out in the land because these people had been given time and time and time to repent, but they were wicked and evil. And they had these pagan practices, which involved the slaughtering of innocent children, um, certain types of promiscuous activities, you name it, they were doing it and they weren't repenting from it. And Israel was told to wipe them out, strike it from their, their practices, get away from them as quickly as they can and take their land that was theirs. So continuing on. Now it happened when she came to him, this is the wife. So if we go back a little, whoa, 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 whoa. If we go back a little bit. Um, we see that Othniel, right? Wasn't that his name? Uh, yeah, Othniel. Othniel, the son of Kenneth, Caleb's younger brother, took it, gave him his daughter. So now the daughter is going to ask. Now when it happened, when she came to him, that she urged him to ask her father for a field. So she's telling Othniel, make sure you get some land. And there's going to be some specifics of the type of land that she asked for. So when she dismounted from her donkey and Caleb said to her, what is it that you wish? So he, so she said to him, give me a blessing since you have given me land in the south. Also, Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms, which is south. Okay, I'm, I'm going too fast. I'm going to stop. Shelley, why do you think this woman asked for a land that had springs of water in it to feed to feed i mean you yes. need water to live and yes work and all that right so Thanks. exactly so one of the things that we forget in our culture nowadays is the bare necessities that you needed to survive right you needed land you needed land that you could cultivate and farm and you needed water in order to provide water for your crops and for your animals so that then you could have sustenance and eat. That nobody was driving down to um, <clears throat> Moses in the box. That wasn't happening. There was, <laughs> there was, <laughs> there was only, you know, what you, you, you ate what you grew kind of a situation. So I, obviously asking for water was of, of severe importance. So moving on now. The children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the south near Arad. And they went and dwelt among the people, and Judah went with his brother Simeon, and they attacked the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormah. Also, Judah took Gaza with its territory, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers. <clears throat> but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had said. Then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak, but the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. So the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. The name of the city was formerly Luz. And when the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, Please show us the entrance to the city, and we will show you mercy. So he showed them the entrance of the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites, built a city, and called its name Luz, which is its name to this day. A few things to take away from the latter part of chapter, or this mid part of chapter one, I should say, is the city of trees. You're going to see that come up a few times. That is Jericho, or the city of palms. And I actually got a cool picture of it today in one of these ladder slides. I love it, buddy. <clears throat> um, and then we see here that they took over everything from the mountain, but they didn't have the ability to take over those who had the chariots of iron. And we will see that come up again. But the people are doing 
thus far, exactly what they were told to do. And we see that God's with them. Okay? Now, however, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under tribute, but did not completely drive them out. I have that underlined for a reason. They were told to drive these people out. And that is why I think the author is placing emphasis on the fact that they did not. Commentators also point out the fact that they were not following the law of God, which had these things lined out in detail. But we do see a seemingly strong start to the people gathering initially and asking God what they should do and how to do it. But here's here's a downfall right here. We're going to see more. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahadal. So the Canaanites dwelt among them and they were put under tribute. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or Ahlab or Akzib, Helba, Aphek, or Rehob. So the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but they dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath were put under tribute to them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Heres, in Aijalon, and in Shaalbim. Yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under tribute. Now the boundary of the Amorites was from ascent of Akrabim to sit from Selah and upwards. So, Names that should be coming out to you guys. We see Zebulun. We see Naphtali. We see Ephraim. We see Joseph. Whose names are those? Twelve tribes. Yes. This is Israel, which is made up of 12 parts, the 12 tribes. This is what they were doing during that time. So, chapter 2. Then... The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Boshim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out. Before you, but they shall be thorns in your side and their gods, whoops, their gods shall be <clears throat> a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Then they called on the name of that place. Then they called the name of that place, Boshim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gaash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. So we see this huge effort take place. For an extended period of time, over a century, we see Joshua living for 110 years. We knew Moses lived for an extended period of time before him. They see all these things tangibly happening. They were told to keep these commandments 
perpetually forever. And they were supposed to teach them to their kids. It's very important for our kids to know the Ten Commandments. I was thinking about that the other day and I was quizzing my children. Hey, do you guys know the Ten Commandments? Let's go through them together. And they knew quite a few of them. We, we still got some work to do, but um, they did know quite a few of them. And one of the, the main commandments is, Levi, thou shalt have no other what? No other gods before me. And we just saw in the opening section of chapter two that they did not tear down the Baals and the Ashtaroths in the neighboring lands. And they co-mingled with the people when they were told to drive them out. So that gets us into the second part of chapter two. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtaroths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity. As the Lord had said, and the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Okay, so if you guys remember, Baal, or Baal, was, uh, I want to say he was, uh, it was the sun god. He was something to do with the sun, and that's where they believed his height of his strength was at the heat of the day. That this is when Elijah had, had challenged the prophets of Baal to do this, to light this fire on the temple and Baal just didn't do it during the hot of the day. And he was laughing at them saying, oh, you know, maybe he's taking a leak or maybe he's not available. Maybe he's sleeping, right? And then he calls on God, the, the real God, to, to light the fire. Yeah, or maybe he's on vacation. That's right, Levi. <laughs> so, Ashtaroth. Okay, this is where, you know, everyone's, then some people may get offended or whatever it may be. There is different names of what the Ashtaroths were, but this was supposed to be the god of plenty and of harvest. Also went by Ishtar and Istar, and you know where we get our traditions that come along with that. That's why, you know, it, it kind of closes that loop on rabbits being a symbol for um, fertility and yet we have eggs with rabbits, which doesn't make any sense because rabbits don't lay eggs. So the, the list goes on. It's a sign of fertility. And what they would do is they would essentially have um, groups of women going into the cities to promote fertility. And you can imagine that that would be quite enticing for men. And so uh, it was something that, that was a form of what they were doing. And we could see that they had turned to this. And I mean, you could, you even today, you know, you could very well see that being appetizing to individuals uh, if that's, you know, a form of practice. So moving on. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted to behave more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of the Lord, anger of the Lord was hot against them. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and has not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. So that through them, I may test Israel 
whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. So, <clears throat> what we see happening here is you will see a pattern, and it's prefaced right here in this last section, is that Israel is going to be sore displeased by the, the behavior of the occupying power. And they're going to cry out to God, and God is going to raise up a judge for them. The judge is going to do something that will release the bondage. That period of time, people will be, oh, you know what? God is great. God is good. Let's the commandments. Let's follow the feast days. Let's honor God. And then the next generation that comes up is just like, who is this God? And then boom, they're into bondage again. And then we see this pattern repeat itself. And you could say, how stupid they can they be? I'm excited to share next week. I didn't do it this week, but next week I'm going to bring up the cycle of nations is what it's called. And we'll talk about that then. But don't say that this is just Israel. And we could even look at ourselves at how quickly someone, uh, you know, the, the verse that comes to mind is a dog as it returns to his own vomit. You know, someone who says, oh, I'm never going to drink like that again. That was, I can't believe I did those things. And then they're back at it the next day over and over and over again and the same commitment i'm never going to do this i'm going to change i'm going to do different i'm going to and they just keep returning back to that same error in their ways so now these are the nations which the lord left that he might test israel by them that is all who had not known any of the wars in canaan this was only so that the generations of the children of israel might be taught to know war at least those who had not formerly known it. Namely, sorry, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal, Hermon, to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of of Moses. So what's I have them posted right here. Michelle, can you read that from here or no? Commandments? Yeah. What's number command number one? Okay, and number two? Make unto the, any graven image. Okay. And the last one that I'm gonna have you ask, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Okay. And remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet. Good job. So what do we see? Those were the commandments by the hand of Moses. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be wives and gave their daughters to their sons and they served their gods. Our God is a jealous God. He doesn't like that. So what do we see? So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord, their God, and they served the Baals and Ashtaroths or Asherahs. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hand of Cushan, Rishothaphim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan, Rishothaphim, eight years. While the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel. Who delivered them? Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishthathiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and he prevailed over the over Cush Cushan Rishathiam, so the land had rest for forty years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Did you say no? No. You said no. Okay. So first judge, Othniel. They're in bondage eight years. Israel cries out. God raises up this guy to Othniel. 
He wipes out the king and the occupying power. They have liberty. 40 years later, he dies. And the children of Israel, again, did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because he had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. Shelley, pop quiz. What was the name of the city of Palms? We just talked about it. Do you know, Michelle? It's not Palmdale. <laughs> Jericho. <laughs> Jericho. Thank you, Miguel. Yes, it was Jericho. Okay. So. And Palm guys, Springs. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Do you guys remember who Anak was or Anak? This one's a, this one's deep. Uh, this one's I don't remember if we've talked about that. He was one of the of the giants, ain't he? Yes. Okay. And the that was the where we get the Anakim, which is the people who were um of the giants, and we know that they were also called the Nephilim or the Rephaim, I believe it is, and they were the just weirdly, I believe half men, half angels. Yeah, they were giants. They were just giants. So, uh-oh, my computer's doing some stuff. You guys still there? Yes. Okay. Now, so the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. So, I'm going to add something here. It's not in the text. This is something I got from Chuck Misler, and I thought it was cool. The Benjamites were known for being ambidextrous. They were both left-handed and right-handed, okay? If you were a left-handed man in the culture, it was seemingly a curse. People thought if you were left-handed, you were cursed. What Chuck Misler points out is they're not saying that he's left-handed. They're saying that he's disabled in his right hand. There's something wrong with him, okay? So it will share some insight on the rest of the story that this is a disabled individual. So by him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length and fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So if you were going to check someone for a weapon and you noticed that they had a shriveled up right arm and there was something wrong with them, you wouldn't even consider their right leg. You would look to their left leg to where they would have their weapon fixed, right? Do you guys see what, do you see what's playing into, into play here? So moving on. And fastened it under the clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And, and, <laughs> and when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And, the, and this is the king saying, he said, keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehu said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. So you can, you guys, just if you're closing your eyes and you're imagining this, just the image that you get is the Jabba of the Hutt. Just super, super fat guy. People had left from presenting the tribute, which was probably food, money, and all those things. And they're going to prepare him something to eat. He hears that there's a secret message for him and he's excited about it. So he sends everyone away and they go up to his private chamber and that's where he goes to talk to Ehud. Then Ehud reached with his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly and his entrails came out. Okay. This guy is so fat. They say that these blades are normally a cubit in size. 
and a cubit was 18 inches, fingertip to your elbow, that would be the blade. The handle would be a few more inches behind that. This guy was so fat that when he stabbed him in the gut, that his fat swallowed the handle as well. He's a big boy. Okay, <laughs> Michelle's back there making sound effects. <laughs> and so, for he did not, for he did not draw out the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. And when he was gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, "He is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber." Okay. The, I believe the original text says his cloak is on his feet. Okay? What do you think that means, his cloak is on his feet? What do you think that means? Why would his gown be on his feet? When, when would you, he had his pants down. Yeah, well, he was sitting down, taking a probably taking a grab. <laughs> So he's attending to his needs, right? And they waited so long that they became embarrassed. And that still, he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore, they took the key and opened them. And there was their master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sariah. So here's Ehud, possibly handicapped right man, drives this this dagger into his gut, kills him, locks the doors, escapes out the window. The people come to check on him, think that he's using the restroom, and they just wait around, giving Ehud all the time to escape outside of where their army's at. So now, and it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Then he said to them, follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time, they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So God used one guy, I think it how many years of oppression was it? Was it eight years? The first one was eight years and they had 40 years of rest. That was off now. Now they have Ehud, we'll call him the handicap, where he goes in after being in bondage for how long, Michelle? Does anyone remember how many years they were in bondage for? Hey. I, I thought it was like 20. Oh, where's it at? It's right here in the, the thing. All right, well, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. So anyways, they had rest in the land for 80 years. So after him, this is a one-line judge. We have Shamgar. And I had to find a picture of what one of these things were. Have you guys ever heard of an ox goad before? I think we've... Oh, you know what? We talked about it with Paul. It is hard for you to kick against the goads is something that Paul mentions, okay? And in a, a goad was this spiky tool that they would use when they were having the ox pull the plow. They would clip the back of its heel right above its hoof where it's, a, I guess it's a real sensitive spot for the ox and it would cause them to move their path. Like if they were walking to a cliff or something like that, they'd hit him with an ox goad, okay? So we see this guy, Shamgard. He's a son of Anath. He killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So now that's our third judge. We have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. Now, when Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of the Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Hashoresheth, Hagoyim. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. And for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. 
Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, of Kiddush in Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor? Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. And Barak said to her, uh, I will go if you go with me. <laughs> then I will go. But if you will not go with me, then I will not go. This will show you how tough these guys are. <laughs> right? So yeah. what does she say? I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So... Deborah says that this guy will be delivered into the hands of the hands of a woman and that there will be no glory available for him. And, you know, it's kind of a sign of the time, but whatever. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kiddush and Barak and Zebulun and Naphtali to Kiddush. And he went up with 10,000 men under his command and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber, the Canaanite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near a terebinth tree at Zanim, which is beside Kiddush. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up from Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him, from Herosheth Hagoim to the river Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Up! For this is the day which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from the Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as of the Herosheth Hagoim, and the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. I'm going to go back one slide. We see here about, there's a, a small little excerpt about Moses' son-in-law being outside underneath the terebinth tree. Okay, and I, I, I can't believe I just lost my spot. Okay, oh, there it is. Uh, Mother-in-law had separated himself from the Kenites. So Heber, the Kenite, of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Zenayim, which is beside Kadesh. We see at the very tail end of this that Sisera, the leader, the commander, the guy in charge who is persecuting everyone, flees essentially into that area. And J.L. went out to meet Sisera and said to him, turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. So this is someone who was essentially at peace at, at so well that they thought, but they were still tied to um, Israel, right? And so we see that this, and a man was never supposed to enter a, a woman's tent too. I remember hearing that. So, and when he had turned aside and went with her into her tent, she covered him with a blanket. Then, she sa then he said to her, please give me a little drink of water for I am thirsty. So she opened up a jug of milk and gave him drink and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the door of the tent. And if any man comes and inquires of you, and says, is there any man here? You shall say no. Then Jael, Haber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And then as Baruch pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, 
Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera dead with a peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So, who ended up killing the king, Sisera? Uh, A woman! JL, yes, Michelle, I heard you too, Uncle Charlie. Yes, the woman did, and how did she do it? Uh, yeah, yeah, she, she, uh, she put the tent spike to the ground. So, she was good with a hammer, I've heard. So, that was under, was it, I said Deborah at the beginning, right? Yeah, so we see Deborah, and then, gosh, that that guy's name, I was a, uh, no, 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 no. Barack was the, the military leader. So, no, 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 no. Then Deborah and Barack, I can't even call him that anymore now that you've said that. I guess it's maybe it's Barak, okay? The son of Abinoam saying on that day, saying, when leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord. This Sinai before the Lord, God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anoth, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. Arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Speak you who will ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, and who walk along the road, far from the noise of the archers among the watering places. There they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, the lead, and lead your captives away, O son of Ebenoam. Then the survivors came down, and the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples, from Makur rulers came down. And from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As Issachar so was Barak sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings for the flocks? The divisions of Reuben, having great searchings of heart, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Zebulon is a people who jeopardize their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. O oh, my soul, march on in strength. Then the horse's hooves pounded, the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse, Miraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, nor or to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite. Blessed is she among women in tents. He asked for water, she gave milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She pounded Sisera, she pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet he sank, he fell, where he sank, there she 
There he fell dead. The mother of Sisera looked through a window and cried out with through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Her wisest ladies answered her. Yes, she answered herself. And they are and are they not finding and dividing the spoil to every man a girl or two? For Sisera, plunder oh, plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dried, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter. Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. So the land had rest 40 years. And I'm going to stop there. We're going to learn about Gideon um, and Midian <laughs> next week. So for the homework for this week, I want you guys to go ahead and read chapters 6 through 10. And uh, we'll continue on there. Just as a, a quick recap, we see the nation of Israel having peace and posterity and they're doing very well and then they they intertwine themselves with these neighboring nations that serve other gods they turn away from the true god they take up their idols they worship their gods they go after their their same practices god removes himself with his protection over them a judge is raised up during the time that they call out because they're being so badly and hotly oppressed and god provides them with a redeemer of sorts to get them out of that land this last excerpt in chapter five, you can just see this woman, Deborah, having this long exhortation about how even Sisera's mom is wondering what's taking so long. And the people are saying, oh, it's because he's done so well in battle that they're that they're dividing the spoil and looking for women to bring home with them. And this, this, this and that, when in reality, he's laying there dead with a tent spake in his, in his head. So that is the first five chapters of Judges. Is there any questions on the book of Judges? thus far.